Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. On Snoozecast, we read excerpts from public domain works and, occasionally, original stories. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on social media and wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd like to thank our listeners. If you enjoy our show, please write us a review. Also, share it with a friend. This episode is brought to you by The Sounds of a Tennis Ball Volley. Tonight, we'll be reading from The Art of Lawn Tennis, written by William Big Bill Tilden, published in 1921. Tilden was considered one of the greatest tennis players of all time. Born into wealth, Tilden earned large sums of money during his long career, and he spent it lavishly, keeping a suite at the Algonquin Hotel in New York City. Much of his income went towards financing Broadway shows that he wrote, produced, and starred in. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. The Art of Lawn Tennis I trust this initial effort of mine in the world of letters will find a place among both novices and experts in the tennis world. I'm striving to interest the student of the game by a somewhat prolonged discussion of match play, which I trust will shed a new light on the game. May I turn to the novice at my opening and speak of certain matters which are second nature to the skilled player? The best tennis equipment is not too good for the beginner who seeks really to succeed. It is a saving in the end, as good quality material so far outlasts poor. Always dress in tennis clothes when engaging in tennis. White is the established color. Soft shirt white flannel trousers, heavy white socks, and rubber-soled shoes from the accepted dress for tennis. Do not appear on the courts in dark clothes, as they are apt to be heavy and hinder your speed of movement. And also, they are a violation of the unwritten ethics of the game. The question of choosing a racket is a much more serious matter. I do not advocate forcing a certain racket upon any player. All the standard makes are excellent. It is in weight, balance, and size of handle that the real value of a racket frame depends. While good stringing is essential to obtain the best results. After you've acquired your racket, make a firm resolve to use good tennis balls, as a regular bounce is a great aid to advancement, while a dead ball is no practice at all. If you really desire to succeed at the game and advance rapidly, I strongly urge you to see all the good tennis you can. Study the play of the leading players and strive to copy their strokes. Read all the tennis instruction books you can find. They are a great assistance. I shall be accused of 
press agitating my own book by this statement, but such was my belief long before I ever thought of writing a book of my own. More tennis can be learned off the court, in the study of theory, and in watching the best players in action, than can ever be learned in actual play. I do not mean to miss opportunities to play. Far from it. Play whenever possible, but strive when playing to put in practice the theories you have read or the strokes you have watched. Never be discouraged at slow progress. The trick over some stroke you have worked over for weeks unsuccessfully will suddenly come to you when least expected. Tennis players are the product of hard work. Very few are born geniuses at the game. Tennis is a game that pays you dividends all your life. A tennis racket is a letter of introduction in any town. The brotherhood of the game is universal, for none but a good sportsman can succeed in the game for any lengthy period. Tennis provides relaxation, excitement, exercise, and pure enjoyment to the man who is tied hard and fast to his business until late afternoon. Age is not a drawback. From a long and many times sad experience over a period of some 10 years of tournament tennis, I believe the following order of development produces the quickest and most lasting results. 1. Concentration on the game. 2. Keep the eye on the ball. 3. Footwork and weight control. 4. Strokes. 5. Court position. 6. Court generalship or match play. 7. Tennis psychology. Tennis is a game of intimate personal relation. You constantly find yourself meeting some definite idea of your opponent. The personal equation is the basis of tennis success. A great player not only knows himself in both strengths and weakness, but he must study his opponent at all times. In order to be able to do this, a player must not be hampered by a glaring weakness in the fundamentals of his own game, or he will be so occupied trying to hide it that he will have no time to worry his opponent. I am trying to make clear the importance of such first principles as I will now explain. Concentration Tennis is played primarily with the mind. The most perfect racket technique in the world will not suffice if the directing mind is wandering. There are many causes of a wandering mind in a tennis match. The chief one is lack of interest in the game. No one should play tennis with an idea of real success unless he cares sufficiently about the game to be willing to do the drudgery necessary in learning the game correctly. Give it up at once unless you are willing to work. Conditions of play or the noises in the gallery often confuse and bewilder experienced match players playing under new surroundings. Complete concentration on the matter at hand is the only cure for a wandering mind, 
and the sooner the lesson is learned, the more rapid the improvement of the player. The surest way to hold a match in mind is to play for every set, every game in the set, every point in the game, and finally, every shot in the point. A set is merely a conglomeration of made and missed shots, and the man who does not miss is the ultimate victor. Part 2 The Laws of Tennis Psychology General Tennis Psychology Tennis psychology is nothing more than understanding the workings of your opponent's mind, engaging the effect of your own game on his mental viewpoint, and understanding the mental effects resulting from the various external causes on your own mind. You cannot be a successful psychologist of others without first understanding your own mental processes. You must study the effect on yourself of the same happening under different circumstances. You react differently in different moods and under different conditions. You must realize the effect on your game of the resulting irritation, pleasure, confusion, or whatever form your reaction takes. Does it increase your efficiency? If so, strive for it, but never give it to your opponent. Does it deprive you of concentration? If so, either remove the cause, or if that is not possible, strive to ignore it. Once you have judged accurately your own reaction to conditions, study your opponents to decide their temperaments. Like temperaments react similarly, and you may judge men of your own type by yourself. Opposite temperaments you must seek to compare with people whose reactions you know. A person who can control his own mental processes stands an excellent chance of reading those of another. For the human mind works along definite lines of thought and can be studied. One can only control one's mental processes after carefully studying them. A steady, phlegmatic baseline player is seldom a keen thinker. If he was, he would not adhere to the baseline. Pick out your type from your own mental processes and then work out your game along the lines best suited to you. Few of us have the mental brilliance of Brooks, but all can acquire the dogged determination of Johnston, even if we have not his tennis ability. Personality is submerged. Unity of purpose as a team replaces the object of personal glory that is the keynote of championship. It is the friendly rivalry of sport between such men as form the backbone of tennis in each country that does more for international understanding than all the notes ever written from the White House. I could go on writing tennis psychology as explained by external conditions for hundreds of pages but all I want to do is to bring to mind a definite idea of the value of the mind in the game. Stimulate it how you will. A successful tennis player must admit the value of quick mind. Do it by a desire for personal glory or team success or by a love of competition in matching your wits against the other man's, but do it some way. Do not think that tennis is merely a physical exercise. 
it is a mental cocktail of a very high kick. The Psychology of Match Play The first and most important point in match play is to know how to lose. Lose cheerfully, generously, and like a sportsman. This is the first great law of tennis, and the second is like unto it, to win modestly, cheerfully, generously, and like a sportsman. The object of match play is to win, but no credit goes to the man who does not win fairly and squarely. A victory is a defeat if it is other than fair. Yet again, I say to win is the object, and to do so, one should play to the last ounce of his strength, the last gasp of his breath and the last scrap of his nerve. If you do so and lose, the better man won. If you do not, you have robbed your opponent of his right of beating your best. Be fair to both him and yourself. The play's the thing, and in match play, a good defeat is far more creditable than a hollow victory. Play tennis for the game's sake. Play it for the men you meet, the friends you make, and the pleasure you may give to the public by the hard-working yet sporting game that is owed them by their presence at the match. Many tennis players feel they owe the public nothing and are granting a favor by playing. It is my belief that when the public so honors a player that they attend matches, that player is in duty bound to give of his best, freely, willingly, and cheerfully, for only by doing so can he repay the honor paid him. The tennis star of today owes his public as much as the actor owes the audience, and only by meeting his obligations can tennis be retained in public favor. The players get their reward in the personal popularity they gain by their conscientious work. The Psychology of Physical Fitness Physical fitness is one of the great essentials of match play. Keenness can only be acquired if the physical, mental, and nervous systems are in tune. Consistent and systematic training is essential to a tournament player. Regular hours of sleep and regular hearty food at regular hours are necessary to keep the body at its highest efficiency. Food is particularly important. Eat well, but do not overeat, particularly immediately before playing. I believe in a large, hearty breakfast on the day of a big match. This 
should be taken by 9.30. A moderate lunch at about 1 o'clock if playing at 3. Do not eat very rich food at luncheon as it tends to slow you up on the court. Do not run the risk of indigestion, which is the worst enemy to dear eyesight. Rich, heavy food immediately before retiring is bad, as it is apt to make you loggy on the court the next day. It is certain injury to touch alcoholic drink in any form during tournament play. Alcohol is a poison that affects the eye, the mind, and the wind. Three essentials in tennis. Tobacco, in moderation, does little harm, although it too hits eye and wind. A man who is facing a long season of tournament play should refrain from either alcohol or tobacco in any form. Excesses of any kind are bad for physical condition and should not be chanced. Late hours cause sluggishness of mind and body the next day. It's very dangerous to risk them before a hard match. The moving pictures immediately before playing tennis are bad, owing to the eye strain caused by the flicker of the film and the strong light of the camera. Lead a normal, healthy life and conserve your nervous force wherever possible as you'll need it in the hard matches. Staleness is the great enemy of players who play long seasons. It is a case of too much tennis. Staleness is seldom physical weariness. A player can always recover his strength by rest. Staleness is a mental fatigue due often to worry or too close attention to tennis and not enough variety of thought. Its symptoms are a dislike for the tennis game and its surroundings and a lack of interest in the match when you are on the court. I advocate a break in training at such a time. Go to the theater or a concert and get your mind completely off tennis. Do your worrying about tennis while you are playing it and forget the unpleasantness of bad play once you are off the court. Always have some outside interest you can turn to for relaxation during a tournament, but never allow it to interfere with your tennis when you should be intent on your game. A nice balance is hard to achieve, but once attained, is a great aid to a tournament player. I find my relaxation in auction bridge. I know many other players 
who do likewise. The laws of training should be closely followed before and after a match. Do not get chilled before a match as it makes you stiff and slow. Above all else, do not stand around without a wrap after a match when you are hot or you will catch cold. Many a player has acquired a touch of rheumatism from wasting time at the close of his match instead of getting his shower while still warm. That slight stiffness the next day may mean defeat. A serious chill may mean severe illness. Do not take chances. Change your wet clothes to dry ones between matches if you are to play twice in a day. It will make you feel better and also avoid the risk of clothes. Tournament players must sacrifice some pleasures for the sake of success. Training will win many a match for a man if he sticks to it. Spasmodic training is useless and should never be attempted. The condition a player is is inapt to decide his mental viewpoint and aid him in accustoming himself to the external conditions of play. It seldom pays to get a crowd down on you. It always pays to win its sympathy. I do not mean play to the gallery. 